we have awesome guests on this show all the time, but I have a very special place in my heart for actual clients of mine who I have seen blossom and share their passions with the world and make a difference. Because on this show and on my platform, I'm all about empowering us in all the ways. We are out here breaking generational curses in all the ways. And one of the areas that I talk about specifically in my book that I've had to navigate through is this warped idea that Latina motherhood means giving up your dreams. And I experienced that firsthand by watching my mother intentionally sacrifice her own ambitions, her own career goals, her own financial security, because that's just what you do. Or at least that's just what you used to do back in the day when you decided to become a mother. And so this next guest, so excited for you guys to meet her because she is out here literally giving us permission to challenge all the bullshit that we've been told about what it means to be a Latina and a mom so that we can break those curses around the idea that we need to be self-sacrificing and that our families don't deserve better versions of us. So Jessica, welcome to the show. Super excited to have you here. Yes. Thank you so much, Janice. I really appreciate you inviting me and for giving the space for me to be here. Absolutely. Okay. So let's start off with an introduction. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. We're going to dive into your backstory. I am a mommy of two boys. So that's something that I usually say in the beginning, because if it wasn't for them, this platform wouldn't exist. And they are little. So I am also going through the trenches of raising two little boys who are three and under. I married my high school sweetheart and we all live in Chicago. So I'm, I'm a true Chicagoan by heart, born and raised. And we are now raising two little Chicagoans as well. Go Cubs. <laughs> and by trade, I am a college counselor. So I work as a part-time college counselor for a non-for-profit in Chicago. And I'm also a stay-at-home mom, which is 24-7. That is a job in itself that isn't compensated at all, but it is so much hard work, let me tell y'all. But I'm also a, a mompreneur, and this is something important for me as someone who not only wants to just be a mom, I want to coexist in a world where I'm also able to bring my passions out there and be able to talk about my experiences. And so I'm the founder of Viva La Mami. It is a podcast and an online community to empower the millennial Latina mom and to help her redefine what madrehood means for them. And so kind of like what you mentioned, we are in a generation where we are just trying to break cycles of trauma, cycles of money, you know, that you often talk about here on your podcast. And I am here to provide a culturally relevant space for the millennial Latina mom who not only wants to honor her cultural traditions and her cultural upbringing, but also may want to embrace this life as a modern mom in the United States specifically. And so as Latina moms, we have this duality where we're not only moms, we are Latinas. And so how can we really cultivate these two forces and create something that is different, that perhaps wasn't something that we grew up with, because many of us are probably first, second gen, and we were often influenced by the old school traditions of parenting. But now we want to break that and do something a little bit more different that creates balance between the two cultures. I love that. So let's dive into your backstory about why you're so passionate about showing up for moms in this way. What's been your journey to motherhood and kind of what were some of those enlightening moments that you had where you're just like, mm, I feel like there's a big part of this conversation that somehow nobody's having. Yes. So I became a mom, a first time mom during the midst of the pandemic. Oh, geez. Talk about trauma. <laughs> yes, yeah, so much. And just like a different experience. And so I already felt isolated in itself, literally and figuratively, because no one before me experienced going to a prenatal appointment alone, mm. right? Because of those mandates. And luckily, my husband was able to be there for me during childbirth. But 
I wasn't fully able to get a doula, which was something that I wanted because back then no one was vaccinated and I want to protect us, but also the doula. So I worked with a virtual doula, but not like in person. And so I had all of these like goals and aspirations, right, to do things differently, but somehow I was forced to have a total different experience. Through that time when we were home and we were in isolation, really, and in quarantine, I was trying to look for community. And when I was going online, I was searching for Latina moms and everything that I got and saw were just like the negative stereotypes of Latina moms. The junklas and the rage. <laughs> yes, the fury, you know, those kind of reactions. And I'm like, okay, this is something that we can relate, right? But this isn't something that I want to emulate. I don't want to be that mama. And for me, I was really raged. I was like, what is going on? It might have been postpartum hormones. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> but I wanted something different. I wanted to change the narrative. And unfortunately, I didn't see anything. And I know that ever since we, my husband and I decided to be parents, we wanted to be different parents. Not that we had a horrible childhood, but as products of first generation immigrants, there were definitely a lot of imperfections that we wanted to change once we became parents. And so I'm like, how can I create something that where I can talk about my experiences, but also validating those experiences of other moms that perhaps are going through the same thing and help empower them to do something different. And as Latinos, we get very influenced by what people say. We get very influenced by the critiques that your mom gives you. And maybe you don't want to do whatever you're told. You're probably like wanting to be rebellious, but for some reason you can't because of que va a decir la gente, right? What others are going to say. And I think that as a mom, you have that power. As a mom, you are in a position of leadership where you get to choose where you want your children to go in terms of the type of parenting style you want to approach this, where it's not necessarily based upon us growing up. And that is okay. And so that's why I'm here to normalize that. Yeah. You know, questioning the systems that have been in place and the way that things have been done can make people look at you sideways. And I think especially like parenting is one of those things that everybody's judging you. Even people who aren't parents got opinions. And I'm always just like, sit the fuck down, okay? You have no idea. Like I'm really not out here ever trying to judge no parents because I'm like, you know what? Y'all look like you got the hardest job in the world. And I'm pretty sure anybody who is a parent who's listening to this podcast is like, girl, yes, thank you. So I want to know for you, like what is the definition of like a modern Latina mom? Because I think we all have, like you said, this perception of like what a quote unquote traditional mom is. <laughs> but what does the <laughs> modern mom look like in, in the Latina community? Yes. So for me, the modern Latina mom is having a blend of your cultura, hence Latina, you know, the cultural roots that you come from in whatever kind of identity you want to identify. It's not necessarily if you are bilingual, you speak Spanish, because oftentimes that's when people think, but no, it's okay if you don't speak Spanish. We all know that there's reasons why and systems that were put in place to dismantle the, the Spanish language. So it's any kind of identity that you have with you. But when it comes to the modern millennial Latina mom, right? I think that in our society, in the United States, there's this concept of modern parenting or modern mothering. And this is usually moms that are not so traditional where they are work, like being stay at home moms, where they are working moms or they are stay at home working moms. And so there's a lot of variances with that. And this is oftentimes when you have a partner or a support system as well. And so when we think about this modern mom, that she is a lot different than our moms or the generations before us. But for some reason, we still feel the shame and the guilt to be this perfect mom, to be this total present mom, to be this mom who is always physically, emotionally available for her kids. And for me, I'm like, no, this is why we live in a culture and a society where we have that choice and decision to accomplish whatever goals we want. 
And as long as you have a support system, and it doesn't have to be family, it can be friends, neighbors, there are people with you who can be your village. And what I find interesting, Janice, is that as Latinas, we grew up knowing that we have a village in whichever capacity it is. But since the U.S. is so individualistic, we ignore that. And so with me trying to say, how can we leverage our culture? This is one way in which we can bring that back and reclaim it into a way that doesn't make us feel like we are isolated in this experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think about kind of older generations of my family and like everybody used to live together in the same city, in the same town. So you would be at Abuela's house one day, you'd be at Titi's house the other day. Like there was a whole community of people that you could rely on in your general vicinity to help you raise your child. And that's where that whole like takes a village comes from. Nowadays, if you don't have the village, you have to potentially outsource that village by like hiring help, which is a whole other thing that I think there's a lot of stigma around in our communities, especially around the idea of like hiring a nanny or like hiring a housekeeper to help you keep your house clean or hiring a cook or whatever. There's so much judgment, I think, that comes from folks who decide to take that approach. But I think we have to get very realistic and remember that it's much more normal nowadays to live very far from your family and from what would be your traditional support systems just because of employment opportunities, where you want your kids to go to school. There's a lot of things to factor into that. And so if you don't have your village built in, you're going to need to get the resources to create that village in whatever way makes your life a little easier. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I think also, too, we are in a generation where the breadwinning mom is a thing that we didn't have to deal with in the past. You know, it was just a default expectation that the men were going to be the ones that worked and brought home the money and then mom would stay home. There's a whole dynamic that is shifting, I think, as a society. And so one of the things that I associate now with modern parenting too is more of an equal or some sort of equity when it comes to parenting. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't have context for because you just were used to kind of the women of the family raising you. Whereas now there's this expectation where if you are in a heterosexual relationship, that your partner is going to be just as present of a parent as you are as the mom. Absolutely. And that's something that we do, my husband and I, we are both present. And, and even though women do take on a lot of the invisible load that oftentimes we don't talk about, right? Where we are put in these gendered roles specifically like, oh, you are the default pairing for making the doctor's appointment for your kids or what have you. Like that, I still am balancing that and I'm trying to give more of the load to my husband. But as a Latino too, he is battling with that identity because he grew up not knowing anything else. His, his dad didn't even feed him a bottle. Right. <laughs> it was his mom did everything. And I'm just like, mind blown, right? But that was that generation. And it's just one generation apart. And so I always say kudos to the dads, especially who are doing the work. Not that they need to get a prize or anything, because we still deserve that. <laughs> but there is a lot of work to get done. However, I do see progression and that's something that I love seeing. Yeah. I mean, it takes two to make the kids. So, I mean, yeah, we need to be out here doing the work. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that I have noticed with like friends and just family members who become moms is the general sense of it becomes your entire identity and all those things that you hoped and dreamed for you got to kind of put them by the wayside because it's selfish now to like want your own accomplishments, to want to achieve your own goals as a mom. What do you say to people who are struggling with that guilt of like still wanting something to define them beyond motherhood? Something that I encourage moms to do is to bring something back that they enjoy doing. And that way they can reestablish their passions back. And these can be little steps. Like for me, for example, I used to run a lot. Like I used to be a runner, not competitively, but that was something that I really wanted to do. And since becoming a mom, it all takes this like mental sort of shift, right? Where you put your own excuses to say, I don't have enough time to do X, Y, Z. But guess what? You can always find 10 to 15 minutes. You can always carve out that time 
to focus on something that you used to like. That can be one little baby step. But I know that there is this huge leap oftentimes when moms decide to end their careers or pause their careers for a little bit. And they battle with that identity where they used to be working moms and now they're stay at home moms in this example. And and that was something that I still battle with, Janice, because I was someone who used to check all the boxes to get up in my career. And now that I'm a mom, I'm like, well, I also want to take care of my kids because I don't want anyone else to. I want to be in control of that. And so it's always important to accept in whatever season you're currently in that it is temporary. You're always going to move into the next chapter and there might be something new. And I was formally educated through a social justice lens uh, when I got my master's degree and One of the things that we talked about when it came to theory was identity formation. And as human beings, we don't just conform to just one identity. We evolve. And that's something that I tell moms, you're going to evolve wherever you're at right now. Even if you are struggling, try to bring a little bit of your passions back, but know that you are going to evolve and grow into something different than you currently are in your current season of life. I love that. You know, And I think it's a good reminder that if you're feeling those feelings of overwhelm, of feeling like every second of every day is just being sacrificed to someone else, I think it's a good indicator that you're probably not asking for the support that you need. Because there's so many of us who battle with this feeling of it looks weak or it looks like you're incompetent if you ask for help. And I think especially as mothers, there's this perception of being judged for wanting help or for needing help. So how do you recommend that folks navigate those feelings too, right? Because it's almost like it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're overwhelmed, but you don't ask for help and you keep being overwhelmed and you never actually get out of that loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my recommendations would be to have that self-assessment that, you know, when you are feeling overwhelmed, is it because you're doing too much Or is it because you are not asking for help? And I think that that definitely coincides a lot. And that is shown up a lot when you are parenting, when you are mothering. Rage comes up. You are becoming very sensitive with like noise and you get overstimulated. And oftentimes you're not even able to be present because you're constantly in this overwhelm sort of state. And I think that it is important to, if you are in a partnered relationship, and that's something that I told my husband from the very beginning, I'm like, if you see those signs, please call me out (laughs) because maybe that's one indicator that I'm probably doing too much. (laughs) Yes. And I do need a break. (laughs) And I'm glad that he does that. And if you are a single mom, then listen to your body. What is your body telling you? Are you getting sweaty hands? Is your heart like pounding a lot? What is it? And it's really important to catch those sort of signs because that's when you know that you need help. And for us as Latinas, we grew up not asking for help. And I always saw my mom. She was the super mama. She was a working mom. She wasn't a stay-at-home mom. She was a working mom. And she still did a lot of work during that second shift that we often call. And I'm like, how does she do this? But I do remember her not playing with us. I do remember her not having that quality time necessarily that even till today I still yearn for as an adult. And so seeing that, even though she was a great mom, she's still a great mom, I still wanted something from her. And that is because she didn't ask for help or because my dad was kind of blinded and he didn't see that too. And it's nothing to blame them, right? That's just how they were growing up. And that's just how they, for me, growing up, seeing it in a cultural standpoint. And so for us, as second gen, first gen mujeres that are here in the U.S., this is our ability to change that narrative, to switch that and say, no, I need help. And I'm going to lean in to my community and whatever these people, individuals look like or who they are. I'm still going to reach out to them because I know that I need my time in order for me to be a good mom and a present mom. And it's a battle for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I was having this conversation earlier with a, a wellness coach and she said something really that made a lot of sense, which is the best gift you can give your family is like you pouring from an overflowing cup. 
because otherwise they're going to get the scraps. And think back to your childhood when you know that like your mom was running on fumes and she was irritated and she was annoyed and like everything you did was just irking her spirit. Like we all had those moments as kids where we just realized like, oh, is it because of me? Am I doing this? Right. And like most of the time, your mom's reaction literally had nothing to do with you. It had to do with all the other fucking stress that she was navigating. And like just the child rearing was the tip of the iceberg. And so I think it's like if we don't want to repeat those patterns, we have to operate completely differently. We cannot be giving our family the scraps and then expect them to have these amazing memories of childhood when we're giving them the bare minimum. All right. So obviously, because we as Latinos love to talk shit. We love to gossip. We love to be judging the shit out of people. I mean, this is why like novelas and all that is a whole genre in our community. Okay. People love having opinions on parenting and especially the toxic relatives who swear that they were the best parents. And they're usually the ones with the kids who are all fucked up, but that's neither here nor there. Let's talk to folks who are dealing with those toxic family members who have all types of opinions about how you're raising your kids. What do we say to them? I would say, fuck you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's as simple as that. <laughs> yes, but we can't, right? Because we got to be respectful. Yeah, yeah. And I we got to be... say it under our breath when they <laughs> yes. are not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely recommend setting boundaries. And I know that in our community, we are so bad with that. We are so bad with setting boundaries with our own family members because of, again, lo que va a decir la gente, right? What are other people going to say about me? And I think that that is something powerful that you can teach your kids to learn how to set boundaries for yourself and for the protection of your family. And your mental health, jeez. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Because girl, like, and either way, people are still going to say stuff. Like for me, I feel like I'm always judged because our kids go to bed early. And so we often don't go to parties that are past 6 p.m. Or we get a babysitter, you know, and I'm sorry, like, I don't want my kids to suffer because then we're going to end up suffering trying to manage irritated kids who needed sleep the next day. So like, no, I'm not going to go through that just so that my family can see the kids because that doesn't matter. And so, yeah, still going to be judged. And I think as Latinas, we can be very toxic, especially when it comes to seeing what other Latina moms are doing. But I think that if you don't want to be a part of that conversation or if you even don't want to be present there you already like anticipate those kinds of conversations. Then don't go to that event. Don't go to that family gathering. You know who like, it is automatic. Okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I love that. You know, we have to just be okay with people having their specific place in our lives. And sometimes you're just going to have to have family members at a arm's length because you just already know this is just not an area we're going to agree on and it is what it is and it's fine. So I'm curious for you because you are a mom raising boys and machismo and all of the shit that comes with our culture when it comes to the men. I hate to say it, but a lot of these men are out here being toxic because of what they learn from their mothers and fathers. So how can we specifically as women, those of us who are mothers of boys, how can we break that cycle? Because Lord knows we don't need another generation of men who just ain't doing what they got to do. Yes. For me, well, first of all, I am so glad I have boys because we grew up with a bunch of women in my family, like too much estrogen, <laughs> too many opinions. I'm like, yes, too much drama. I'm like, we need to balance this out. And so I always wanted to be a boy mom, but knowing that having or raising boys will come with a lot of work, especially when it comes to raising two brown boys, that in itself is already like a twofold kind of experience. And so I am just really glad that my husband is different than the way that his dad is or that other men are. He is more open. And that's why we're together. Because yeah. <laughs> otherwise, we'd be like, no, screw you. <laughs> <laughs> but I do see them. And I actually shared this one, I think, like a couple of weeks ago in my Instagram stories about the level of treatment that I'm starting to see my three-year-old have as a boy versus girls that are surrounded 
together. And I'm like, adults suck. Like, I think that it just all depends on the way that you want to raise your kids and how much of an impact you're making in their lived experiences. And for me, I am very aware and conscious about having my kids feel comfortable in being emotional, in showing feelings. My kids have dolls, and I think that is okay because one day they're going to be nurturers as parents if they want a parent. And I think that it is important to not just force out those stereotypes or, you know, that machismo, because guess what? We are going to repeat the cycle. And they are very well aware of boys can play with anything. It doesn't have to be trucks or dinosaurs. My kid put on some lip gloss of mine and I'm like, okay, cool. You want lips? that are kind of shiny, that is totally okay. But if we enforce them to be no boys don't cry, or boys shouldn't be wearing lipstick or whatever, like, again, we're repeating that cycle. And that is just not healthy. And they're also not going to be open minded. Because guess what, the world is no longer super gendered, right? It is very fluid. And it's more open than even one generation ago. And I want them to have those conversations and feel like, okay, I can empathize. I understand you. So yeah, it is very complex. And I'm I'm a boy of very young kids. And so right now I'm not really putting them in positions of like these specific gendered roles. We'll see once they start school. So we shall see. Yeah. You know, it's a lot to think about just the level of influence and all of those, even subconscious messages that you're giving your kids by you know, saying something like, no, you can't play with that. Or, you know, we don't wear that color, whatever. So that's all part of the deprogramming and just the breaking of these cycles that were not necessarily like super productive and positive for us. So I'm curious, what made you want to put yourself out there in this way as a mom of talking about this? I know I've seen you talk on social media about how white the mothering space can be. And so I'm curious, like, what's your, been your experiences now showing up as a content creator who's talking to Latina moms? Yes. And that's one of the reasons why I created this platform. Because if you go on Instagram and you search mom, you see all these images of like white moms. And I'm sorry, there's Latina moms, there's black moms, there's Asian moms. And it is annoying because I feel like there's a lot of people like me that are doing the work that are spreading the word in terms of cultural relevant narratives that people can be connected to. But I think the Instagram algorithm in regards to Instagram specifically, like we are overlooked. And so unless you are searching up for modern Latina mom, because if you search Latina mom, well, here comes the negative stereotypes of them. So it's very, I can be hidden, but I'm out there to just change the narrative and also to show representation in this space. The motherhood space is very white centric. And even though there can be some nuances that we can relate to, like, for example, as modern moms, we can relate to them, but there's no mentioning about our culture. There's no mentioning about how to raise bilingual kids or how to raise kids from a cultural relevant standpoint. You know, we have tortillas. And, and even like playtime, right? Like there's so many toys that are just very white centric too. And so it is very hard. And I am here to just like break that and tell moms that, hey, I am someone that you can connect to. I'm here. I exist. And let's talk about our experiences because it is very hard to parent in itself. Being a mom, it is so hard. But being a Latina mom has its complexities as well because we are trying to raise a generation that is resilient, that has already broken a system that sometimes didn't go in our favor and that are healed. We are healing, but we're hoping that our kids are already healed from the traumas. But if there is no conversation about the nuances of being a Latina mom, then how are we supposed to do that? Yeah. I I love that perspective. And, you know, I think also too, I've seen content creators from our community, like use 
that stereotypical mom character or caricature, I should say, as like a comedic thing, you know? And it's just like, at some point we got to realize like, if we're making a joke of this shit, it's like, are we really advancing the cause if we're making ourselves the butt of the joke? Or can we just acknowledge that that was our existence, that was our experience, but like, what are we getting from continuing to just use that as the singular lens through which we view motherhood? I don't think it's productive, you know? Yes. Yeah. So I want to know from you, for the moms who are ready to start choosing themselves a little bit more, who are ready to not be defined solely by motherhood, but are ready to step into this identity where you're just self-expressed in all the ways. What's your best advice for getting started on that journey? Yes, I think in order for you to just be yourself and live this true, authentic way of being a mujer, I think that you should put yourself in that mindset that you are women first and then you are a mom. I think being a mom is wonderful. It is a journey in itself. It is hard work, but it shouldn't fully define you. And it is okay. There is this concept of intensive mothering and that this is when moms are usually showing up 100% physically, emotionally, financially towards their kids and they lose track of themselves. And that shouldn't be that way. I think that you should take care of yourself in order to take care of others. And we grew up knowing that, no, everyone is before us and then we're last. Let's break that. And so one step that I recommend is kind of reflecting on what you want out of your own motherhood experience. What is it? How present do you want to be in front of your kids? How present do you want to be with yourself? And it takes a lot of soul searching. It does take a lot of perhaps journaling. I know that journaling is very helpful, but set those goals and you can start little. You can set monthly goals. Okay, this month I'm going to get my nails done all by myself, no one else, uninterrupted. Like I'm going to do this. And then you can start create those habits in which you can put yourself first. And I know that the shame and the guilt is going to come. Your mom's going to be like, oh, yo te mire viéndote aquí, but you, shouldn't you be with your kids? And without any apology, just say, I wanted to do this for myself. And I think we have that ability to feel empowered to do that. And if you don't, well, I'm here for you because this is when we just need to change that. We need to take care of ourselves, not just others. Because otherwise, we're not going to be happy moms. We need to be chill moms. Yeah, that's how we break the actual stereotype of the angry Latina mother. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, and I think it's also important to realize, like how you said, everything is a season, right? And at some point, your kids are not going to need you up their ass because they're going to be grown ass adults. And if you've spent the past 18 plus, 20 plus years just focusing on that singular identity, you're going to find yourself in the same position that people who retire and had no hobbies and had no passions find themselves lost because your entire existence has been wrapped up in motherhood. And then when you're not needed on that daily basis anymore, you're just like, well, what the fuck do I do? Who am I? What do I like to do? What are my hobbies? You know? And so I think it's like maintaining that long-term perspective that yes, you're a mother for life, but there are different types of intensities when it comes to it. And you never want to get to a place where you forget who you are. Yes, it's so important. Absolutely. You know, I could talk about this forever. It's just, there's so many intersections of our identities that impact our lives. And I think parenthood is one of those things where a lot of people can either find that new purpose that drives them forward when we think about like your whys for why you want to build wealth or why you want to create your business empire, whatever it is. And I think that's the most important message here. It's just like the day-to-day -day can be exhausting. The systemic and societal things that make parenthood difficult are real, but you don't have to do it alone. And so with folks like you, Jessica, who are empowering women in our community to 
redefine what motherhood looks like and to really create that new path. I'm so excited for the impact that you're going to continue to have. I would love for you to tell us where folks can find you, how you work with people and, you know, what's what's coming up in store. Yes. Well, people can follow me on Instagram. I'm only on Instagram. I'm a old school millennial. Don't do TikTok yet. <laughs> so the kids wrap you up in TikTok. They're going to force you to get on there when they're older. Oh, gosh. <laughs> we'll see if it's still going to be around. Yeah, exactly. but, <laughs> but yes, people can find me on Instagram at Viva La Mami all together. And I also have my website, my blog as well, which was something that you helped me create which is vivalamami.com. And I'm also on the Viva La Mami podcast where you can listen to episodes and real like raw experiences of mothers share their identities as Latina moms. And so, yes, I am also very excited that I initiated my coaching program this year. And so the second cohort will start in the fall. And so if you want to join the wait list, you can either follow me on Instagram or go on my website. You can also join my newsletter to learn for ways in which you can join the wait list. I love that. So what do you do in your coaching program? What does that consist of? Yeah, so the coaching program is intended for the modern Latina mom, so very specific, where she feels lost in her identity as a Latina and trying to balance that identity with modern parenting. And so I share different pillars that are very specific. One of them is how you can bring back your passions. Another one is setting boundaries with your family, because that's a big one as Latinas. And the other pillar is finding balance between your identity as, as a Latina mom. And so it's a very intuitive program, very reflective. I think we talk a lot about our traumas. So it is something where you will, will be on a, in a vulnerable state. But in order for us to do something different in our parenting and whatever goals these moms have in mind, they need to speak about the past and how they can change that because then we're going to repeat the cycle. Absolutely. That self-awareness is the key to making those shifts. So, so excited for folks to find you, follow your journey, visit Jessica at Viva La Mami on Instagram and find out all the things because we are a generation of change makers in all the ways. And that includes how we raise the next generation. So Jessica, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely.